Following the theory that when your basement floods, the first thing you need to do is stop the leak, how do we make remyelination happen? First, we have to stop the demyelination process. Hello and welcome to another episode of You and Me and Multiple Sclerosis. My name is Pam. I've been living with multiple sclerosis for almost 40 years. And we've been covering remyelination therapies a lot in the past few months. Seems to me that just about everybody is running experiments and clinical trials and doing research to figure out how we can remyelinate our nerves. And there have been some pretty creative ideas, I would have to say. But I have a couple of articles to share with you today, though, that make total sense to me in that they're coming at this from the opposite direction, basically. They're saying, well, there's not much point in having remyelination therapies if we don't understand why we demyelinate our nerves in the first place. And so we will be looking at these two articles, and hopefully you'll get a pretty good idea that once again, we've got some fundamental research underway that could lead to some pretty big breakthroughs in this field. I saw this first article in Medical Express, and it was published on November 5th of 2024. It's called, Researchers Discover Critical Link Between Myelin Repair Failure and Neuron Damage in Multiple Sclerosis. Oh, and look at that. It's put out by someone at Oregon Health and Science University. And of course, we know how much I appreciate OHSU and their neurology department. So now I'm really eager to find out more. The article says that multiple sclerosis, a neuroinflammatory disease that affects nearly 3 million people worldwide, causes a loss of myelin, the fatty sheath that covers nerve cells in the brain and spinal cord. Chronic loss of the protective myelin harms neurons. This damage leads to worsening disability in diseases such as MS that cause demyelination. However, it's still unclear how this process causes neuron damage. So we're looking at some fundamental research here. As described in a study published in Nature Communications, Oregon Health and Science University researchers have developed new mouse models, there are those mice again, to confirm the link between failure to repair the protective covering around nerves and loss of neurons. So we're talking about a failure to repair, and that's a new idea, at least to me. They also identified a specific protein pathway that is related to the death of demyelinated nerve cells. This must be why we wind up with black holes in our brains. Either by pharmacologically or genetically blocking this pathway, we could prevent the death of neurons in these chronically demyelinated mice, said Ben Emery, Ph.D., corresponding author of the study. Emery is the Warren Distinguished Professor in Neuroscience Research and Associate Professor of Neurology in the OHSU School of Medicine. It is unclear why some humans' myelin repairs itself faster than others. Myelin also repairs itself faster in mice models than in humans, which is why the researchers genetically modified the mice to block remyelination and better mimic the pathology seen in human MS. The researchers studied two types of mouse models that experience demyelination. One can repair itself or remyelinate, while the other cannot and suffers from lasting loss of myelin or demyelination. Both types of mice show damage to their nerve fibers, but the ones that can't remyelinate have more neuron death and increased inflammation. In contrast, the mice that can repair that protective covering show less neuron death and better recovery. The study's lead author, Gregory Duncan, Ph.D., a postdoctoral scholar in Emory's lab, developed this mouse model and discovered this link between the protein pathway and neuron death. These genetic models that Greg's really pioneered are going to be useful for not only our lab, but probably many others to test neuroprotective strategies in this ongoing work on MS and other demyelinating diseases, Emery said. Mice that can't remyelinate also show increased activity of a specific protein pathway linked to the death of nerve cells. 
when researchers blocked this pathway, it prevented neuron death in the damaged mice. The mice that repaired their myelin did not turn on that specific pathway, showing a direct link between the pathway and long-term myelin loss. It might suggest that inhibiting this pathway could be beneficial in preventing neurodegeneration or slowing the progression of MS, Duncan said. We have to be cautious, though, because this specific pathway has many roles in development and regeneration, so any therapeutics developed would need to be targeted to avoid side effects and still be useful. I'm glad he's already looking at possible unintended consequences, because so often we gain in one area, but it comes at a price. And so I'm glad that they're already looking at that aspect. Duncan and Emery said, the model developed in this study will pave the way for other researchers to discover more about this important but still somewhat mysterious process that damages nerve cells. So that is the end of that article. Very interesting. I'm glad they're taking the approach they're taking because if we can get to the bottom of why demyelination happens in the first place, we can stop the death of nerve cells, which really is almost the point of no return, at least for current thinking. It's really hard to work on remyelinating a non-existent axon, and it's hard to even think about how you would restore a nerve cell that was totally gone. And as you can see in your own MRI, if you've got black holes, as they call them, that's what that is. It's a dead and totally disintegrated and gone nerve cell. And so if we can stop that from happening, we would be way ahead of the game. This next article was published on November 12, 2024 in Multiple Sclerosis News Today. It's called National MS Society Grant Aims to Make Astrocytes Supportive Again, Scientists Testing Ways to Prevent These Nervous System Cells from Turning Toxic. And we've talked about astrocytes before in other videos. So this is, and again, they're circling back around to some cellular components that seem to play a big role in the demyelination process. Not because astrocytes in and of themselves are bad, but because something about MS turns astrocytes rogue. And the article says that backed by a $1 million grant, Researchers at Case Western Reserve University in Ohio will explore ways to keep astrocytes in check, protecting the nervous system from damage due to multiple sclerosis. These star-shaped cells of the brain and spinal cord go awry and become toxic in this disease. The National Multiple Sclerosis Society grant was awarded to a research team co-led by Paul Tazar, Ph.D., and Ben Clayton, Ph.D., both with the university's School of Medicine. Their project will investigate treatments that may stop toxic astrocytes from forming in lab and animal models of MS, with a goal of stopping and possibly reversing MS disability caused by accumulating damage to the nervous system. Our project's hypothesis is that by targeting and inhibiting the formation of these toxic astrocytes, we can effectively protect nerve cells, halting or even reversing disability in MS. Clayton, a founding member of the Institute for Glial Sciences at Case Western Reserve, said in the University News Story, there's an urgent need for treatments that can protect, potentially regenerate nerve cells. There is indeed. I would agree with that, and I'm sure you would too. In MS, an overactive immune system mistakenly attacks the myelin sheath, a fatty covering that insulates nerve cells and allows them to transmit electrical impulses much more efficiently. Loss of myelin along with ongoing inflammation damages nerve cells, causing disease symptoms like fatigue, difficulty walking, and vision loss. Current treatment options for MS focus on reducing inflammation to slow the damage caused by repeated immune system attacks against the myelin sheath, but no therapy can completely halt or reverse existing damage. There's an urgent need for transformative therapies that not only slow damage, but also protect and potentially regenerate nerve cells, said Tazar, who directs the Glial Sciences Institute. 
Growing evidence suggests that astrocytes become reactive in response to inflammation in the central nervous system, brain and spinal cord, further contributing to the neurodegeneration that characterizes MS. Normally, astrocytes provide support to nerve cells and are an energy reserve for their function and survival. Using a lab model that mimics how astrocytes form, Tassar and Clayton's team screened thousands of chemicals and identified a class called HDAC3 inhibitors that can stop astrocytes from acquiring their disease-causing toxic traits. Wow, that sounds like a major breakthrough to me. Compounds targeting astrocytes to be tested in animal and human MS models. The scientists believe that targeting toxic astrocytes in a way that returns them to being supportive cells represents a shift in research toward treatments that may halt and possibly reverse disability. Our aim is to pioneer the discovery and development of new medicines that specifically prevent the formation of toxic astrocytes, offering a groundbreaking direction in MS therapy, Clayton said. Yeah, you know what's coming to mind for me is that if you can stop astrocytes from turning on the myelin, then you not only stop or limit the damage that it's caused, but at that point, the neuroplasticity of your brain will help you reroute or do whatever is necessary to regain that lost function. I think that's certainly possible. Within a limited sphere, at least, we shouldn't discount the brain's ability to do even more than we think. They go on to say, with the, res with the society's support, they now will test the inhibitors in a mouse model of MS. Thank you, mice, for all you do. Assessing whether the chemicals can protect nerve cells and promote repair, easing disease severity. In a later project stage, the scientists plan to use brain organoids, lab-grown models derived from tissue donated by people with MS that resemble simplified versions of the brain to test whether selected compounds show benefits in human models. They note that it could take years before identified compounds might enter clinical studies. So yeah, don't get in a hurry. You're not going to be seeing this show up on clinicaltrials.gov anytime soon. But that's kind of how breakthroughs are, right? You have to have the fundamental science down and you've got to test it and retest it, make absolutely sure you're right before you go any further with it. They go on to say that realistically, it could be a decade or more before treatments based on this research are available to patients, Tazar said. However, each step brings us closer to potentially life-changing therapies for those affected by MS. With their grant, which comes as part of a $4.6 million National MS Society initiative to accelerate research into nervous system repair and multiple sclerosis, Tassar and Clayton also will look into genes involved in the formation of toxic astrocytes. This may help to identify potential targets for future treatments. And the sooner the better is all I can say. Well, I don't know about waiting 10 years, but that's the time it takes. That's the time it takes. I'd rather have them be thorough and slow and get something out that's not going to be harmful, but it's going to be effective than to rush it to market only to have the unintended consequences kick in, right? I know, it seems a little disappointing in a way, but at the same time, I'm glad they're going about this in a very rigorous manner. I found this video of Dr. Paul Tazar speaking about the work that he and his team are doing in this area. And even though it may not seem to directly relate to what I just was talking about, I think that it is corollary, maybe precursor to the work that was featured in the article. Neurological disorders are the leading cause of disability and the second leading cause of death globally, claiming 9 million lives and costing over $1.5 trillion each year. Developing medicines that meaningfully improve the lives of patients suffering from neurological diseases is one of the biggest unmet medical needs of our time. My research takes a fundamentally different approach to discovering and developing innovative new medicines for neurological diseases. Instead of focusing on nerve cells, we've turned our attention to the other half of the nervous system, glial cells. 
the word glia comes from the Greek word for glue. While they were once thought to simply hold the nervous system together, we've now learned that glial cells play highly specialized and essential roles in maintaining the health and function of our nervous systems. When these glial cells are lost or become dysfunctional, it leads to numerous neurological diseases that impact millions of people around the world. At the Institute for Glial Sciences, we focus on three central questions. What are the genetic and environmental drivers of glial cell dysfunction? How does dysfunction or loss of glial cells initiate or exacerbate various neurological diseases? And can we fix broken glia by discovering new classes of glia-targeted medicines? Over the past 15 years, my team has focused on one specialized glial cell type called oligodendrocytes. These cells normally provide a protective coating called myelin around nerve cells, but are lost or destroyed in diseases such as multiple sclerosis. We've built pioneering cellular technologies that have given us unprecedented access to study these cells in the laboratory. Using these technologies, we've developed high-throughput screening approaches that allow us to test tens of thousands of potential drugs in parallel to identify effective therapies that can fix or regenerate glial cells. So far, our work has led to the discovery and advancement of two novel therapies, a remyelination drug for multiple sclerosis, which is approaching clinical testing at Convello Therapeutics, a Cleveland-based biotechnology company I co-founded, and a separate therapy for a rare pediatric neurological disorder called Palaisius Merzbacher disease is now being tested in patients in a clinical trial at Ionis Pharmaceuticals. Our success wouldn't be possible without the tremendous support we've received from Case Western Reserve University, our colleagues, and our collaborators. We owe immense gratitude to the visionary and unwavering support of philanthropists and investors who have allowed us to transform our bold ideas into impactful discoveries and bring our science from the academic lab to patients. I couldn't be more excited about the future of the Institute for Glial Sciences. Our team is rapidly growing and we're expanding our efforts to understand and develop new therapies targeting additional glial cell types. Quite simply, our vision is to change the future of neurological disease treatment. Well, what do you think of all that? I'm pretty excited. I think this is the right direction, really, because there's no point in trying to walk better on a broken leg until you fix the broken leg. And you can give me all of the, the walking aids in the whole wide world, but if my leg is still broken, I'm not going to be walking any better. Maybe this kind of thing has been going on for a long time and we just weren't told a lot about it. But now if they're looking at understanding the process of demyelination, what mechanisms in the body trigger demyelination, we can work on stopping that. And if we can stop that, we'll have less to remyelinate for one thing. So that those of us who haven't had a lot of demyelination yet, not that I count myself on that group because I'm pretty sure I've got quite a bit, but those of us early in the process, if we can stop the demyelination process in its tracks, um, there may not be a lot of damage that happens from multiple sclerosis. And so that would make life a lot better. We're really focusing on quality of life as much as possible because we know that until a cure is found for this rotten disease, and let's call it what it is, we need to make sure that we focus as much as we can on improving our quality of life and keeping it just as good and high and strong as it possibly can be. But that's all I have for you today. So please do take really good care of yourself until my next video, and I'll see you again soon.